Hello, everyone, and welcome to ALP 307, the public policy lab, financial challenges facing U.S. cities at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I'm Professor Josh Rao, and today we're thrilled to be hosting three expert panelists to discuss economic development in cities across the U.S. Dr. Tim Bartik, Dr. Becky Lester, and Dr. David Newmark. I'm also grateful to the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Hoover Institution for supporting this webinar. So today's topic is economic development, building cities for the future. As we know, governments use a range of different policies to boost their local economies and promote growth and innovation. In particular, economic developers very frequently make use of tools like tax incentives and abatements and exemptions to attract new firms to their cities and retain existing businesses, and also increasingly use other incentives such as innovation hubs, manufacturing hubs, and the promise of a supply of skilled workers for firms who locate in the city. While billions and billions of dollars are spent by local governments on economic development each year, the overall impact of this investment is in fact uncertain. Let me provide a little bit of background on our course for our viewers. This is an experiential learning class in which we've partnered with three cities across the country, each a different size in a different region and with different economic and political landscapes. We have three work streams on which student groups are working to assess city policies, conduct research, and make data-driven and evidence-based policy recommendations. Those areas are infrastructure, debt and pensions, and of course, the topic of our webinar today, economic development. Over the past few weeks, we've met with city managers, economic developers, commissioners of public works, and many other local government officials to learn more about what challenges these cities are facing and what keeps city officials up at night. So now we wanna hear from the subject matter experts. The goal of the webinar today is to learn what academic research tells us about economic development in cities across the US, how effective are tax incentives at attracting companies, can the benefits of attracting and retaining companies offset the costs, and how should cities plan for the future? Today's panel should help us answer these difficult questions, but first let me give a few introductions. Dr. Tim Bartik is a senior economist at the W.E. Upjohn Institute for Employment Research and the co-editor of Economic Development Quarterly. Welcome, Tim. Uh, thank you for having me. Dr. Becky Lester is an associate professor of accounting and a Botha Chan faculty scholar at Stanford GSB. She's also a research fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and at the Hoover Institution. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. And finally, Dr. David Newmark is a distinguished professor of economics at the University of California, Irvine, and co-director at the Center for Population Inequality and Policy at UC Irvine. He is also a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics. Welcome, David. Thanks. So I'd like to begin with just some kickoff remarks by each of our panelists today, who will speak with us for a few minutes about what some of the main conclusions are about the use of economic development tools and studies in the US from their research. So I'm going to begin with Dr. Tim Bartik. Tim. Well, I guess some of the things I would emphasize at the outset is that uh, economic development policies, such as incentives, uh, have much higher costs than are commonly realized, but also can have high benefits, which is why they're attractive. Now, the costs are higher than are commonly realized because contrary to what some state economic development officials like to assume, uh, not every firm you touch with an incentive is magically induced to locate because of the incentive. That a lot of these jobs would have occurred anyway, either the company would have located there anyway, or if that company didn't choose that site, some other company would have chosen the site later on, maybe in the near future. So the cost per job is actually much higher than uh, often is assumed by just looking at how many jobs have been incented. On the other hand, the benefits can also be high, and that's because jobs can be very valuable to um, local areas. And the value, sometimes you'll see analyses uh, done by states and cities that focused on the revenue generation. In other words, that look on economic development programs as if they're a way to make money for the city. And what that overlooks, first of all, is the fact that in some cases, the incentives don't induce activity and they're all cost and don't actually increase tax revenue. The other thing they overlook is that when you attract jobs, you attract people and people are costly. You have to hire teachers, you have to improve the infrastructure, uh, 
And once you account for that, the fiscal benefits of these frequently are quite low. That's not a way to make money for a state or city. What it might be is a way to increase employment opportunities. And there's a lot of evidence that local job growth can have very persistent effects on employment to population ratios and real earnings per capita of local residents. But in order for that to occur, you have to increase employment rates. And that's going to vary with whether or not the area is distressed or not. If the area is already booming, you can only go so far in increasing employment rates. It depends on the types of jobs. Can local residents access them realistically, given their skills, given the types of jobs? Do the jobs actually offer some wage premium over jobs that would have been available anyway? Um, do they pay well compared to the credentials required? And finally, of course, public policy can affect this in the sense that there's not some iron law as to who gets the jobs when jobs are created by economic development policies. Maybe we can get to that later on. But the key thing I want to emphasize is I look on economic development policies as being a subtype of local labor market policy. It's a subtype that works primarily on the labor demand side, but has to also be concerned with how the labor supply side reacts to that. Let me stop there and, I'll, and we can get into more questions. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Um, next up for some introductory remarks is Dr. Becky Lester. Becky. Great, thanks so much. I actually have just a couple of short slides I'd like to go through. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. Um, all right, so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I approach this question, and then we'll come back to the kind of what my two main conclusions are at this point in time. So kind of the way I think about the tax system as a, as a tax accountant is typically we think about it as something that would take just takes away revenue uh, or takes away money from individuals or from companies. But could we instead actually start thinking about the tax system as an economic development tool? And I think that's really important for understanding and thinking about incentives and how they can or cannot be helpful. So in particular, if we think about um, trying to use it as a tool, we need to optimize things in terms of, you know, which type of system would most efficiently motivate companies to invest in higher workers, contribute to local economic development, and ultimately provide the highest return on the taxpayer dollars that are used to give to give those tools. Um, well, a thought experiment here. So let's let's think about two different extremes of a tax system. Um, one, which is where you have a state or a locality that provides really, really low tax rates that apply to every companies, um, every company that locates in that area. And so that could be very attractive because the overall tax burden is quite low, um, and it could be quite a, a, an easy system to administer. Um, on the other hand, think about a system that maybe has higher rates just in order to generate sufficient revenue, but then provides targeted incentives at a certain number of companies. Um, and the benefit of that is that it introduces discretion into a policymaker's toolkit, so they're allowed to actually target the incentives of the type of companies they may want to attract to an area. Now, most systems are somewhere in between these two, but I think it's interesting to approach this question from, from this perspective of kind of thinking about two different extremes. So kind of what do we know? What do we know from the, um, the economic research that's been conducted? Well, at a very, very high level, we know uh, certainly that low tax rates attract companies and employees. Um, this is some work that Josh has done um, and also some work that Tim has done with some other economists and some other economists as well is saying that, yeah, that we know that these rates attract um, companies, but actually we also observe that incentives are very, very broadly used in the economy. So much so that they're expected to almost reduce corporate revenues that come in, corporate tax revenues, by almost 40 percent. So, you know, why, why are they used? What's the importance of them? Well, when we talk to economic developers or when I've had conversations with them, they say that these, these incentives are critical. They're almost important or necessary to compete. And a lot of that's because everybody else is using them. So if they don't use the incentives, then they're just going to lose out on, on the jobs that they are trying to create. So if we take a step back, then the question is kind of what's the overall impact of these incentives? And frankly, I would say the my read of the, the evidence is pretty mixed. Um, and you know, sometimes incentives seem to create jobs. Other times they do not seem to have local effects. And then there's all the other um, issues that, that, um, that Tim brought up a minute ago, which is about the additional cost, et cetera. 
Well, when I look at the evidence, I think one of the reasons that we might have some pretty mixed evidence on this is due to incomplete data. So this is going to lead me into kind of two key conclusions um, or what I what I think of, of what of what incentives are at this moment. So just bear with me for a minute. I wanted to show you a little bit about what I mean about the incomplete data that we're trying to base some of our studies on. So this is a map that some researchers will use. It's a map from one of my other papers, which is using data from Good Jobs First. This is a not-for-profit that tries to track incentives. And what you see are like the 27 states in blue are states where like the, the data are so poor that a researcher can't even use them. They just, it's, it's clearly wrong. And the other states is kind of this patchwork of where there are some data, or there is some information, but it's quite difficult to actually, you know, piece together everything that's happening because the information varies a lot across time and a lot across jurisdictions. So I think when we come back to this question of like, how do we think about taxes as an economic development tool? Um, there's really this kind of challenge when thinking about incentives. It's pretty difficult to, I think, fully assess them and fully think about when can they be most effective versus not um, because of this data problem that's really precluding a lot of um, you know, additional research from happening to inform that question. So I've done work in the two areas that I think actually are the biggest challenge here. Um, and clearly, in my, in my opinion, the two of the biggest areas are challenges. Um, the first one is actually trying to get better data on how prevalent incentives are. So I think we really need to understand how prevalent they are in order to really assess the design or use of them. And so this is some work actually with Josh, um, with the state of Alabama and with a lot of localities where we're physically driving and going and meeting with economic developers in counties, asking them to share their data with us so that we can actually comment on the prevalence of the incentives and add that into the discussion and add that into the analysis. And the related point here is that just generally there's a lack of disclosure and transparency around the, the incentives that are given. And I think that really precludes um, a lot more researchers or other researchers from trying to understand what's happening because we just, we can't see what's occurring. And if we can't see it, certainly the, the broader public can't see it either. So let me, I'm going to wrap up here with just giving you two specific examples um, from these two different kind of goals or areas of research that I do. So the first one is just trying to understand kind of what's really happening. How much are we really, how much are state and local governments really giving to companies? Um, it's a lot. So I'm just going to show you an example using data from three Alabama counties. Uh, what we see is that in an eight-year period, over 280 local incentives are given, so not even including the state incentives. Um, in total, these are pretty big, so $316 million uh, awarded to around 77 companies. And what's really important is that 100% of those incentives are totally missing from the common data sets that a researcher might use. Um, and just as a picture, what you see here are incentives broken out by type, but you see that these are all incentives under the jurisdiction of a city or a county official, and the amount of those in total is increasing over time, and you see variation based on if they're giving a property tax abatement or sales and use, et cetera. So I think this is just one step forward to show that we need a lot more evidence around the local incentives to truly assess the local and state incentives to assess the design. And then the, the second thing I'll, I'll uh, comment on and then wrap up is this trend, this idea of transparency and disclosure. So a lot of states are moving towards passing more laws around trying to provide some type of information about who the public dollars go to. States give away a lot of money for these incentives. And I think increasingly there are calls for more information around them. So good jobs first. This is their favorite saying, which is, Sunshine is the best antiseptic and, and assuming that the public is kind of a good monitor, um, whether or not that's true, I think remains to be seen. Um, but this idea that there should just be more open disclosure around it. One example, this is a, a screenshot from Virginia where they have their own, uh, this is an example of a portal. If you go to Virginia, you can see a list of company names, um, you know, date that an incentive was given, the type of incentive, et cetera. And more and more states are doing this, but this is really not done at all, I think, at the local level. So what I find so far is that, or in my research in this, is that this does seem to help um, with the effectiveness of incentives, having more information around um, that seems to actually be a mechanism to force governments or force companies to, to follow through more on their objectives. But what we find is that, that that conclusion is a little bit nuanced. So actually, once the public disclosure happens, we see some governments actually like substitute away. They start swapping the type of incentives they give because they would prefer to give incentives that they don't have to publicly report. 
Um, and we also see governments kind of post stale data. So uh, while a disclosure regime might be helpful in general, if governments aren't actually posting all the information or they're not, you know, their feet aren't held to the fire to keep it up to date, it's not clear that uh, these regimes will be that helpful. Um, so I think there's a lot more questions here, but the biggest conclusions I have so far is that I think incentives can be helpful and useful, but we don't really have a good sense of how prevalent incentives are. And then consequently, it's hard to understand um, which ones are most effective. And I think, um, you know, transparency is one way of trying to understand and, and see what, what governments are really spending. The question that I would leave you with is this last one on this page, which we've talked about the first three here, but is, um, you know, ultimately, will there have to be some type of like a multi-state or multilateral uh, solution or agreement across states to kind of agree to not giving incentives? Um, I don't know. Uh, this is happening on the international stage with very, very mixed results and a lot of skepticism. But um, as long as states kind of continue to compete for activity with incentives, it seems like we're going to have a lot more spending without a lot of clear results. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Becky. And finally, turning to Dr. David Newmark for some introductory remarks. David. Thanks. You got my slides up? Yeah. See him? Great. Okay. I'm starting my five-minute timer. Um, this is great. Uh, you know, sometimes when you hear, you're going to hear about the, the academic evidence on a policy question, the evidence is pretty disconnected from policy. But in this case, um, this evidence is all very close to policy. So I'm going to talk about some local job creation policies. Uh, some general issues, but use examples from my research. Um, I was going to call this, it was the best of local development policies. It was the worst of local development policies, but that's a really long title. So this is a shorter version. Um, let me just um, start with the problem. When you're trying to create incentives to encourage firms to create jobs, we should never say Governments don't really create jobs unless they hire people directly, but incentives for job creation. So the primary goal, and Tim alluded to this, is to incentivize the job creation um, as opposed to doing things that maybe put money in the hands of, of, of firms, um, but don't actually create jobs. Uh, I would say, and I, we can come back to this later, I, I have a, a pretty strong view that real estate subsidies are not the way to do this, uh, but that's, a, that's sort of a separate issue. But there's many challenges, even if you decide we're going to go after job creation incentives directly. Uh, you have to reward the changes that would have occurred that would, would that would have occurred only because of the incentive, not the changes would have, that would have occurred absent the incentive. It, but if you think about it, that can be a hard thing to design, right? If, if payroll grows, how do we know if it would have happened otherwise, right? But we don't want to pay for the behavior that would have happened otherwise. We call those windfalls. And there can be some windfalls, uh, but we don't want it to be all windfalls. Um, you, you, if, you, if you say, oh, let's do new hiring. Um, only, well, then companies might churn their workers. Uh, and there's some evidence uh, that, that, that they do that. The more you try to target the incentives well and be clever about that, the more you might raise administrative costs, which can sort of lead to the whole thing not being attractive to firms. Um, when you target incentives, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> based on worker characteristics, and many incentives do, some form of disadvantage broadly defined, there's the potential issue of stigmatizing them. If a worker has to sort of show that they're eligible, it might also show something that signals to the firm maybe that they're less interested in hiring them. Um, I think you want to create, even if jobs are being created, we might be okay with jobs moving from one location to another, but in general, I think, and policymakers seem to agree, we're, we're happier with policies that create new jobs, not that move jobs around, especially within the same jurisdiction that's paying for them. That sounds particularly wasteful. One state might be happy to steal jobs from another state. Uh, so let me give you some examples of things that work well and things that work badly. And there's a handbook chapter I mentioned here. I assume these slides will be available to you, uh, which goes through a lot of this in a lot of detail. Uh, so enterprise zones. Enterprise zones were sort of the granddaddy, I think, of local economic development incentives uh, for a long time. We still have some federal programs and some state programs. I did work on the California Enterprise Zone Program. I think the most studied state program, probably. Uh, there's an absence of clear evidence that these things have created jobs uh, or raised incomes or raised incomes for low-income residents. Take your, take your, it's almost impossible to find a criterion on which they've been successful. Federal programs have been more successful, it seems like, based on some, some evidence um, from Busso et al. Um, uh, but you have this dilemma that the benefits don't seem to be going to the low-income residents of targeted places. Raises a whole nother question. Some people hear local development, they say gentrification, bad, stop the train. 
uh, some people are a little more subtle and say, well, we want some gentrification, but maybe we need to think about how it happens. Um, the California program had particularly lousy design features. The credit was paid for any new hire among those who were qualified. And that was based on target on individual characteristics or where you lived or close to where you lived. Um, wasn't really trying to figure out in any way hiring created because of the incentive. And the biggest problem, I think the credits could be paid retroactively or these tax advisory firms found a big business in helping you claim your credit from up to three years ago. Well, if you're doing that, it's probably not creating jobs. It's just nice, nice, nice gravy for businesses. Um, latest incarnation of a program that I think works badly is Opportunity Zones. I don't know if you've talked about them in your class. These are more, more real estate focused. These are basically, I won't go into the detail, um, but essentially capital gains tax breaks for investment in, in, in real estate, uh, in lower income communities. Um, uh, governors could designate areas based on certain criteria. Uh, the bottom line, as far as we can tell, and there's some other papers now coming out with consistent evidence, uh, residents at least are not helped. Um, uh, it's, it's not clear these are doing much of anything. Uh, opportunity zones also, I think, have really poor design features. In my opinion, targeting real estate investment is not the way to go. If you want to target jobs, it's still tough, but target jobs. There's also particular problems with opportunity zones, and this goes to some of what Becky was talking about. It's very non-transparent. First of all, to claim an opportunity zone tax credit on your tax return, uh, you don't even have to, you just, there's no documentation, you just claim it. Uh, it's been very hard to get data on where these investments are being claimed, where they're going, anything like that. Uh, and finally, I just, I'll just sort of flip the table a bit. Um, I've been studying the last few years this, this program, which California put in place when it killed the Enterprise Zone program, uh, called the California Competes Tax Credit. Um, this, I, I sort of couldn't believe it when I heard what they were doing, um, uh, but they, they build in a lot of the best practices. And, and they did some of this they did deliberately, and some of this they did accidentally. Um, they have explicit eligibility thresholds based on kind of what you're asking for versus what you promise you're going to do. Um, and then there's some discretion on the part of program officials, what Becky talked about, which I think, and I think Tim has some older work, I think also suggesting this is quite important. Um, uh, and uh, and then they have this sort of structure built in, which which lends itself to very rigorous empirical investigation. I think that was the accidental part. They also have a good design feature. They have very clear goals. They're specified up to over five years, and you have to maintain the jobs for another three years beyond that, or they claw back or recapture the credits, and we have evidence they do. We worked with the, go the governor's office of business economic development, a lot of interviewing and talking to them and getting all their data, most importantly. Um, uh, we could match that to census level, establishment level data. We could actually see the recapture of tax credits. That's actually public information. Uh, we have two papers, one showing when you look at kind of location, uh, there's strong multipliers from this in the tracks where these things are awarded. And then we have a firm level data set, which really takes advantage of the structure of the, pro structure of the program, which finds uh, pretty strong job growth effects. And as I said, I think this is due to good design features. So my evolving perspective, and then I'll stop. Before I got to CCTC, I was pretty skeptical. My handbook chapter, if you read it, is pretty negative, um, I think justifiably. Uh, most prior evidence failed to find beneficial effects a lot of the time because poor design was sort of baked into the programs for one reason or another. The CCTC shows that you can design programs better. Uh, they have. It seems to be working. Uh, I will. One important caveat, the people who run it and make the decisions, we've sat in their office and watched them at work. They're really good at what they do. Uh, can that be replicated everywhere? I don't know. Can it even be replicated in California if those people turn over? I don't know that either. But design seems to matter. Stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. These have been some great introductory remarks. And uh, I'm going to start out with, with a few questions on my end. And uh, we'll have some discussion. And then we'll turn it over to uh, students to ask some questions. So one of the things that comes through in a lot of the research is that a lot of these business incentives are rather wasteful. You hear the term corporate welfare a lot, and it doesn't seem to be that far off the mark. Incentives are by and large not that effective at promoting job growth, but states and cities are really enamored of their economic development initiatives. So practically, you know, what, what do we tell them? And, you know, this goes to, to what uh, some of Dave was presenting. There are a lot of bad ideas that we see out there, uh, you know, these retroactive credits or, you know, no doc necessary or you know, credit paid for any new hire without any 
any specifications. And there's some good ideas that you've clearly uh, been able to identify through the, the California Competes tax credit and, and so on. So I guess I guess I, two, two, two questions for, for the group. Number one, practically, you know, what do you, what do you tell a, a, a city or an economic development authority that's, that's looking to improve? And, and secondly, are there other success stories uh, of, of local governments in particular who have, uh, in the words of Tim's book, gone on a more nutritional diet, so to speak, as far as uh, incentives are concerned? Well, I don't know who's, what order we're going in, but I guess what I would say is that it's better to try to reform incentives than eliminate them because, uh, in fact, incentives are politically popular. Governors and mayors who do them get reelected. Uh, people are, in the U.S. are understandably concerned about jobs and employment opportunities, and saying you're not going to try to intervene to affect that is not really politically feasible. So I would say, first of all, you need to provide some alternatives to incentives that might be more cost effective. So I push things like uh, customized job training. I have pushed doing things with uh, business sites, uh, infrastructure, trying to do uh, industrial parks, research parks, high tech parks, business incubators. And I push business advice programs such as manufacturing extension. And there are places that have pursued those very actively and had some success with them. So I live about an hour south of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Grand Rapids is perhaps the most successful manufacturing intensive city, mid-sized city in the US. It's had manufacturing job growth over the last 30 years, which is remarkable given the overall U.S. pattern with the China shock and whatever. Now, some of that is incentives, but a lot of it is they got a regional office of the Manufacturing Extension Service there. They really worked extensively with clusters of business on trying to work with local community colleges and setting up training programs that met their needs. They tried to see if they could find uh, local buyers for family-owned smaller firms that might be otherwise sold off to some multinational, which does affect investment decisions and how they're made, realistically, uh, if you look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, they've also done some things with real estate development, land development. They got Michigan State to put a large part of its medical school there. They've done some things in health research. And so as an example, they've helped some, say, some auto suppliers who are bending metal and molding plastic for autos to diversify into medical instruments, which also use metal and plastic. But maybe as a more rapidly growing market now, you might say, well, how can't businesses do this on their own? Well, if you're a small, medium-sized manufacturer is trying to figure out how to pivot to a dramatically different market with very different uh, regulatory structure, different ways in which you find customers, it's not necessarily straightforward. So I think you need to give alternatives and not just say, well, we're just going to let the market rip and whatever happens to jobs uh, happens. And then I think when we get to actual incentives, we need to give alternatives there as well. I mean, what I've said in the past uh, is, why on earth are you handing out 15-year tax abatements or 15-year wage credits? Who really thinks that companies are making location decisions based on the magnitude of the abatement in year 13? Now, there are reasons mayors and governors do this, namely they're giving away the next mayor's tax base. But it's too tempting to do it. It creates long-term fiscal problems. So I would say, you know, let's have a term of say five years at max. And let's have maybe, let's make them more upfront with a clawback. You know, I kind of like Virginia's approach to incentives. Virginia for Amazon um, headquarters too, which located in uh, DC suburbs, that their incentive was $22,000 payment per job. And it's credited to the company right away, but the company can't access it for four years. The job has to still be around in four years. So it's up front, 
but it also has a delay. It, it, it's an easier way of doing a clawback. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that, that Virginia's approach, and of course, Virginia also combined the incentive with the, the, the they're, they're putting a branch of uh, Virginia Virginia Tech there, and they're, they're doing a bunch of stuff with job training and infrastructure and improving the metro station around there and whatever. So I think they did more than just hand out cash. So in general, my advice is, Look for alternatives such as various business services that enhance productivity. And if you're doing incentives, try to make them more upfront and a little more targeted. So, and Becky, anything to add there? Yeah. So, one of them is exactly what Tim was talking about, which is shifting from this, shifting from just giving cash incentives. So, my impression is that um, you call it 20 years ago and, and probably even still today in many places, it's just like, look, we're going to give you a bundle of cash if you come here. And there's very little reporting required after the fact, very little follow-up. And in my, my understanding is very few clawbacks. So there should be clawbacks, but it's not obvious that they occur. And if they occur, they're probably infrequent. So I think shifting away from just giving cash incentives, just like Tim is talking about, trying to make them, um, you know, an incentive show up actually when or a company be able to claim an incentive if they can actually prove jobs were created after the fact, as opposed to just giving them some cash up front, I think is a step, a huge step in the right direction, um, along with all of these things he's mentioning too, like thinking about um, making investments in the local area and the property and infrastructure and things that maybe could benefit the broader area, not just a specific company. So one is, is shifting the type of incentive. And then the second thing is, again, I'm going to come back to this question of reporting and disclosure, which is, um, you know, requiring a company to act in, in this, in this setting would be requiring a company to actually report back to the city and county about what they've done on an annual basis, requiring them to actually provide evidence that they have created these jobs. And if those um, are not, if they don't come through, then then having some clawback mechanism in place. Now, certainly that's more administrative hassle, but if these are given on the basis of actually creating jobs or a certain amount of capital investment, it seems very reasonable to ask for some type of reporting within the government and then some monitoring mechanism later. It's, it's not simple, but I think it's a pretty important one. Um, and, and also would help the localities understand how much has happened. I mean, one of the things in our conversations with local developers is that they really don't have kind of a, uh, you know, an after the fact assessment of how many jobs they think, you know, often will have an estimate of it, but um, very few, you know, a lot of times the incentives are given based on a promise up front and understanding what really happens on the back end is something that I think is an open question that many, many really want to know the answer to. So some type of reporting mechanism might help them get a little bit closer to knowing those answers. Yes, great. And uh, David has just actually posted in, uh, in the chat a link to something he wrote about a new possible place-based policy approach, rebuilding communities, job subsidies. David, you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, let me make three really quick points. First of all, um, I, I think, uh, you know, you all hit on this. Um, and um, I, I know, Josh, you have in your, in, your, in your pension and debt stuff, right, that, you know, people in, in office are there typically for term, limited periods and delivering some goodies would sound like goodies and paying the cost later um, doesn't, doesn't really bother them. It's actually a perfectly rational behavior. Um, I think what that leads to, and I think the reason, you know, the reason some of what happened in Grand Rapids doesn't happen elsewhere is because, you know, when the mayor can say this company's coming here, that's sexy. When they say, yeah, you know, we, we're, we're building up the community college program in, you know, um, in, in some new area, which you, which you think companies can pivot to, not nearly as sexy. My, Tim was out here a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Grand Rapids. My guess is what's going on in Grand Rapids is you also have a very rich and powerful company that has a rich and powerful family, I should say, that has a much longer term interest in the city than any mayor, mayoral terms. I could be wrong about that. Um, but maybe the externalities are, are captured a little more because of that. Um, I do think to this point, the tr kind of transparency stuff Becky's talking about makes sense. At least the public should know what they're paying and ideally also, you know, hard to answer uh, what they're getting um, to at least hold, hold elected officials feet to the fire a little more. I'm also with Tim on, I, I, don't, adopt, I don't adopt the view, I just scrap this all because a lot of it doesn't work. Um, I think improvement's important. The thing I posted in the chat is, a, is a, something I wrote for Brookings. I won't, I won't go into the details, and now you can read it, but it was really saying, we still have to keep thinking about this, but maybe we have to think about it in a, in a really targeted way because we have severe social problems in cities that come from extremely poor neighborhoods. And I was trying in, this, in that piece to 
based on what we know, not evaluating programs in existence, how would I design a program? What kind of features would I build in that might actually start to deliver benefits at the very local level to extremely disadvantaged neighborhoods? I view that as, in some sense, the, the fundamental challenge um, that we have to wrestle with. Can, can I enter something in here quickly that I do think it's important at some point, and this may be very important for what you're doing with this class. Uh, when we talk about targeting places with incentives, and th this came up when uh, David and I had this dialogue at Journal of Policy Analysis and Management, um, there are programs that try to target uh, local labor markets that might be distressed. And a lot of state and local economic development policies are in that direction, uh, that they're trying to increase overall job growth in the state or in some metro area or whatever. And, and, and the cities, if you talk to a city, they're usually part of some metro, uh, there's, there's usually some kind of metro economic development effort with some kind of coordination and there's some partnership with the state. Then there's the issue of neighborhoods. And what we need to realize is neighborhoods are not labor markets. Uh, local labor markets are local labor markets. The labor market, most Americans don't live and work in the same neighborhood. Most jobs in a neighborhood don't go to neighborhood residents. Most residents from neighborhood don't work in the neighborhood. So one thing you need to recognize is the problem of helping deal with lack of jobs in a distressed neighborhood is fundamentally different from dealing with the lack of jobs overall in a local labor market. It needs a different solution. And in fact, at the neighborhood level, I think you need to work more on the labor supply side, uh, frankly, and, and, and think about solutions there, but linking up with the labor demand side. So it's a totally different type of problem. That's, that's the problem, I would say, with opportunity zones and enterprise zones. It's not really the right tool for that problem, frankly. That was one of the directions, speaking of labor supply, that I, I wanted to bring our discussion into. One of the issues that some of our partner cities are experiencing is a lack of supply of the employees, potential employees with the right skill set, a mismatch between the skill set or education level of the, the city's uh, possible workforce compared with the skills that uh, the high paying jobs that they're hoping to attract would require. And so I, I wanted to ask everyone, how should economic developers think about workforce development? And are there any innovative approaches you've seen cities taking taking, or that they could take to better match their existing labor force with the necessary skills that are being demanded by the companies that they're seeking to attract? Well, I would say they would need to do is, first of all, I'm, I'm a big fan of customized job training programs, which are typically where community colleges work with companies to uh, provide training programs suited to the company's needs, uh, especially if, the, uh, if there are new jobs or expansion. Uh, and as part of that, the customized training program can help expand the hiring pool of the company beyond what they might hire on their own. Um, you, you, so you, I think that's a great approach. Um, it's more feasible than, than doing hiring quotas, which you can do in some cases. But uh, obviously, if you're trying to attract companies, the carrot might work better than the stick. Um, you know, I also think you need to think about, uh, in the case of neighborhoods, uh, the Upton Institute, where I work, in addition to having researchers like me, has an operations division that, that coordinates job training programs in the four county area around Kalamazoo. And the Kellogg Foundation has funded us to run neighborhood employment hubs in distressed neighborhoods of Bell Creek. And that essentially is trying to get the job training programs out of downtown office buildings into the neighborhood and to have, um, basically help that they're located at, at churches in the neighborhood. They're located at subsidized housing projects. There's one at the jail. There's one at, at a community action agency in the neighborhood. And these are trusted neighborhood institutions. So people are more willing to show up there than they might be at some impersonal office building downtown. And then you can actually help coordinate. How, how do we help you find child care? What, what, what job openings are there? What what job training programs are there? Can we get your reliable used car? And then you can also, we, we run some programs with success coaches that help people retain jobs. In other words, they work with companies to help deal with problems that impede job retention. So I think in addition to thinking about these 
incentives, which are trying to work directly on the labor demand side, we need to think about labor supply approaches that actually reach people in the neighborhoods we're trying to reach and connect them up with jobs. We don't have enough what in the European context they call active labor market programs. We really don't have that in the U.S. at, at a large scale. And I add a couple things into that as well. So um, in, in some of our discussions with local economic developers, three things they say are the biggest friction to actually getting people into the labor force. So in, in an environment where the unemployment rate is very low, it becomes very important to actually try to get more people in the labor force to fill all these jobs that incentives have created. And so just like Tim is saying, like the, the frictions that we hear are threefold childcare, transportation, and now with housing prices to some extent, also workforce housing, especially in rural communities, like trying to get a big company into an area um, may be attractive because the you know costs are low and things like that. But if there's not a sufficient housing base there for people to actually move to or live in, or even just quality housing, that's a real friction for actually getting people to fill those jobs. So I think those are the three things, in addition to workforce training, those are the three things that um, I think are very critical for an economic developer to try to think about, and they're not in the business of operating childcare facilities. Um, in some places, like in Alabama, public transportation comes with a very negative connotation, and so running, you know, the public transportation probably isn't isn't sufficiently broad or go where it needs to go, but it also comes with a lot of understandably negative stigma. And so, trying to solve problems like childcare and transportation, and I think increasingly some type of workforce housing are really going to be important in terms of getting more people into the labor force to try to work work the jobs that were created by the incentives. I'll just I'll just second what Tim the first thing Tim said about community colleges. I think there's I think there's evidence varies by state um, that community colleges I guess it's not surprising for those of us at, at non-community colleges are much more attuned to the local labor market, partly because of their mission, partly because they often have, you know, non-full-time, non-tenure stream faculty who are who, who work in industry teaching. Um, uh, so so that's, a, that's a really useful tool. I think two, two caveats. One is states have to fund them the right way. I know in California, for example, we have an extensive community college system, but the funding is the same no matter what you're studying. And it's a lot cheaper to run an English class than a nursing class or a, you know a, some health technology class because there's no technology involved. Um, so I think it takes not just saying we need community colleges and they have to be strong, but they kind of need the funding to support ramping up to, to provide technical skills. Uh, the second is, I think there's still there's still this a problem, and may, you know maybe maybe the things Tim has spoken about at Upjohn have solved this. Of you know these work for younger people, right, who are entering the labor market, don't have high wages yet, so opportunity costs are low, don't have a mortgage, may not have kids. Um, the problem is, you know, we we know there's a problem of low employment among low skilled, much older men, for example. Uh, are they really going to go back to school? Are they really going to enroll in a training program? But obviously, they're part of the potential labor supply pool. And given how much their employment has decreased, there's at least in principle room for increase. Uh, and I think that's a challenge that a lot, at least the community college institutions, aren't aren't that well geared for. There's some older students, uh, but maybe other programs that really reach them and maybe take on the expense of supporting them to replace the income from their crappy job while they train for a better job. Uh, might be necessary. And that's, of course, one area where we've seen, as you're mentioning, you know, really weak, weak labor force participation is, uh, uh, you know, among among middle age, middle aged men, and there's there's been a, a big decline there. And so I think asking the question of what can these institutions do to try to bring some of those people back into the labor force with the, with the right skills is really important. Another observation, it, you know, it seems to me that some of the solutions that um, that have been outlined. Here and, and that some innovative places are undertaking require really good coordination of different government agencies with each other. And 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 uh, you know sometimes I have the feeling that uh, proposing these things to people that we're speaking to uh, or might speak to, they might say, "Well, th this is a great idea, but you know we have to bring together all of these different entities." And I, you know, that, that's that's maybe more of a political problem than an economic problem. Or you know, this is a group primarily of, of economists. But I, I was wondering if anyone had any had any thoughts or comments about about that that practical challenge as well. Well, right. a lot of times economic development agencies, uh, when you actually look at how economic development is organized in the U.S., first you have the state economic development agencies, and then of course at the local level, of those cities particularly large cities may have economic development. Frequently, you do have some kind of metro 
uh, uh, a private uh, nonprofit organization that operates and that works with the local governments as, and they do recruitment, they work with existing business, uh, and they're usually a multi-county authority. I mean, Grand Rapids, uh, I mentioned already, Michigan has the Right Place program, which is a multi-county program. Uh, uh, you know, right around Kalamazoo, there's Southwest Michigan First, which operates uh, in Kalamazoo and one, at least one or two surrounding counties. Uh, uh, Battle Creek has Battle Creek Unlimited, which operates countywide. So typically, the economic development organizations that do a lot of the recruiting and business expansion and trying to get business parks started up and that kind of thing is something that is not actually the city government may help fund it and help influence it and help make some of the money available because economic developers frequently don't have the funds available. But I actually do think that you need to run these things more on a, a local labor market basis, not on an individual jurisdiction basis. The way local governments are organized in the U.S. is not logical from an economic point of view. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is, is um, I think the, 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 the other way that lack of coordination gets manifested is you just get sort of, you know, idea flavor of the month policies adopted uh and without a lot of thinking about how they fit how they work and fit together uh i see that at the state level in california i'm doing this inventory of kind of all policies that you could at least uh, have at least some direct job creation component in them <laughs> there's scores of them uh most unevaluated of course some are valued though but but you kind of look at them all together and you say like what are they trying to do here where, where's the coordination and where are the where are the the, the synergies between them I don't think anybody's thinking about that. Okay, well, that's an important area then for improvement. Um, I would like to turn it now over to uh, participants in the class for uh, any questions that our panelists can answer. Avi. So uh, I understand the broader, I guess, inclination to have economic development departments redirect their budget towards like housing or education, if that, if that is going to be more effective for workforce, but I guess for the context of our project, right, we're trying to advise economic development agencies, maybe some more on the short term with regards to our recommendations. I know Dr. Bartik, you wrote in your book that around like 6% of like the $50 billion economic benefits are dedicated towards service-oriented programs, thinking about like manufacturing extension, small business advisory. So if we were to give these cities the advice of, let's spend more money on one to many types of services, is there a benchmark or some type of like, I don't know, number or another city that they should look towards in terms of evaluating their own budget and saying, hey, we're spending X dollars on cash incentives. We probably want to spend maybe instead of, you know, 6%, like 10% or 20%. Like how can we be directive with that short-term reallocation of resources? And then the second part of that question is for cities that don't have the capability to do that, would you just recommend hiring up? Well, I don't know if I have a magic number to give you because I honestly don't think there's any place that has an ideal policy in the U.S. I guess I would be pushing uh, whatever cities you're working with. Uh, let's find out what, first of all, the situation is with respect to things like zoning of business, business sites. Uh, I mean, let's look about the key factors of production. You know, we have land and labor, for example. Is land available for business development that is attractive to business, that is zoned for business, and that people can get into production quickly? Or is that not true in your city? If you haven't gotten land available for development, why are you even doing anything? Because, you know, you're not going to be able to get anywhere. Uh, and then labor. You need to talk to business. This is where I think, you know, people overdo the cluster stuff. But... But talking to clusters of business and related industries about what's local community college like? Are the programs they have for training in your industry any good? Are they well designed? Are they suited to what your needs are? What kind of training needs might that industry have? Do we need to maybe hire a more specialized faculty? Do we need to work out a procedure where the local community college that we can figure out a funding stream to buy specialized equipment that could be used in training, right? Um, and then small business advice. When you talk to small businesses in the area, talk to smaller employers, 
do they find they can readily get business advice from either a manufacturing extension service, small business development center, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't have a magic formula for that, but I would push to make sure what you're doing in those areas is adequate. And if you want to know how I'd pay for it, I would pay for it by say, restricting the term of incentives and saying, let's let this make them no longer than five years. And let's, uh, uh, that would help pay for some of this. And, uh, you know, now ultimately I think state and federal policy will have to encourage better. I mean, to be honest with you, I think the ultimate solution to this uh, would be if the federal government decide to regulate this to some extent the way the European Union does. But uh, uh, I think it's actually, I, I, I think areas it's in their interest to reform on their own, but we need some federal regulation at some point. Any thoughts about that from David or Becky? Not that specific, no. Yeah, not as not as specific. A couple of a couple of related thoughts, though. So one is um, obviously, like I think what you're saying is they can't change revenue streams or things like that. But is there some ability that a local developer would have, economic developer would have, to actually say, look, let's try and take some portion of this revenue stream and use it to solve some of the frictions that we think are really affecting what's happening in that jurisdiction. So let's try some transportation type of pilot and see if we have like a, I mean, this is kind of a wild idea, but throw it out there, like have like a, you know, uh, same type of bus system that like the Facebook employees had or other employees had to try to get employees from where they are uh, to a different, to the, in, you know, industrial development um area like is there some way that they can use some of their you know take some of the revenues to do that and solve those problems and see if it helps with the workforce participation i think the other thing that's really important is who are who are the companies that are are getting incentivized and getting actually receiving the incentives so one concern is that if if incentives are to continue to be given to kind of you know low wage jobs is it somehow trapping employees in those low wage jobs are there different types of companies that they would rather obtain or rather attract to their area? Now, that's a really, really hard problem to solve, but it comes with overall higher wages and maybe potentially different spillover benefits in the local community. So I think there's a lot of question around when an incumbent comes to them that's already there that maybe doesn't have the wage requirements that they want, do they actually re-up and give incentives to that incumbent? Or do they think more carefully about holding back those incentives or giving lower amounts of incentives and trying to really use the dollars better for some other company that they want to bring to the area. I just say, I'm not sure this is so much a response to the question, but to, to what Becky said, California Compete does pay attention to wages and they pay attention to wages relative to the local labor market. So a call center job in San Francisco might not get any good funding, but a call center job in the Central Valley, which is much more like the Southeast United States, it might be viewed as, as pretty good jobs relative to what they have and, and receive funding. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, so we talked a lot about how to attract uh, companies and thus jobs to maybe economically distressed areas. But if you think about some of those communities maybe being underserved by consumer-oriented businesses, like classic example, groceries and food deserts, how do you think about attracting businesses that would increase the quality of life to a certain area that maybe is not otherwise an attractive investment? See, I think of that as being community development more than economic development. Okay, so and, and, and and I think of that as being important because I think amenities in a neighborhood are important. And that includes things like whether a grocery store is there. And that certainly can be part of what you do. But of course, the dilemma you face is that if you improve amenities in an area without also upping the earnings per capita of residents of the area, then you run into the whole gentrification issue. So I honestly think one key thing you need to do in thinking about neighborhood development that we don't do enough of because the way we fund it in the U.S. Neighborhood development in the U.S. at the federal level is funded through HUD. HUD's more of a housing and, and uh, physical infrastructure type improvement agency. They don't, they're not particularly focused on job training and job development. Labor department doesn't really think in these neighborhood terms that much. And uh, so you need to somehow... Uh, think about neighborhood plans that not only make amenity improvements like getting grocery stores there, but what are you doing to actually help people never get jobs? Or like uh, Becky mentioned, helping with, with transportation as very one very simple thing 
Uh, one common reason people either can't get a job or lose a job is they have a old car and it breaks down and they can't afford to get it fixed. <laughs> can you set up a program under which people can quickly get uh, uh, low cost loans to get their car fixed? Right. Uh, and uh, for a lot of people in the neighborhood, that could be a key factor in determining whether you can get a job and whether you can retain a job. And so my view would be, if you're really trying to help people in the neighborhood, don't just improve amenities in the neighborhood, also increase earnings per capita more directly. Yeah, I, I, I have a maybe a similar reaction, stronger put. I'm, you know, I think we're finally learning, at least to some extent, whether cities will, will you know, um, assimilate this information or not is an open question. Uh, how to make these policies work somewhat better. Um, I'd be disinclined to say, let's let's think about the more direct thing, the more indirect things, I should say, like amenities. Labor supply might be an issue, I agree, but, but I kind of feel like some of those things will follow from job creation uh, and might be a very expensive way to create jobs as opposed to going after job creation directly. But in David, if I could just you know in in your in your California competes work, I mean, how do you know that these are actual new jobs as opposed to people as coming from other places? Um, we well, we we can we don't know. Well, okay, so so um, for the uh, the the track level stuff for residents, we we don't know that necessarily. Um, for the firm level stuff, we can see you know, what's going on at the firm level versus at the specific location. And we can actually do a little bit of work in that. I wouldn't say it's super informative, but a question we haven't gotten into at all, except with this Tim's allusion to national regulation, whether they're coming from other states. Uh, and it doesn't look like they are. It looks like, um, you're, you know, you're actually sort of lowering the cost of doing business and, and, and that's causing employment to actually grow. But it's hard to get at that directly. There aren't many studies in this literature that really get at that directly. There's some studies in France where they actually got access to tax, rec tax records so they could sort of track all the people at all the establishments of a business as well as new businesses. And they found a lot of evidence moving businesses. And I just read a paper for India where it's kind of from a worker survey where people say why they moved. And there's a lot of migration to new jobs among men and interestingly among women, migration because my husband got a new, my husband's, I'm sorry, not migration to new job, migration because my job moved. And among the women, um, migration because my husband's job moved. Um, mm -hmm. So we we do see that in some cases, and I don't know we see it that clearly here. But to my point about um, uh, the distressed neighborhoods, you know, it's not necessarily, it's better if it's all new, new employment, you know, de novo across the whole economy. Um, but if we're trying to go after distressed neighborhoods, you know, if if, if, uh, if Silicon Valley had somewhat fewer jobs and, and a lower income area had somewhat more jobs, same number, same jobs, especially, that might well be a net gain because of externalities that come from um, from job creation in more distressed neighborhoods. Right. And so your point is that now now that we are actually knowing something about we do actually know something about maybe how to structure these incentives uh, to be effective, to improve job quality, go in that direction rather than these more blanket programs like, OK, we're going to do, you know, some infrastructure project that's going to generally sort of improve what life here is like, but might not be, might not have the targeted results. That that's your, that's, that's kind of your statement. That's fair. Those carefully. There probably are some smart things to do on that ladder, on that ladder side, yeah. but I think we have to be careful because a lot of it would be very indirect spending. Yes. There are a couple, I mean, I don't know that Tim and David, you might know a little bit more about these other incentives, but there are some incentives um, for things like uh, retail space or downtown refurbishment or things like that. So it's not exactly getting to what your question is, which is like, how do I get like a Whole Foods to show up in the neighborhood? But I know that there are some movements to grant incentives in places like to try to revive old downtowns and things like that. Um, I don't know how effective those are. My impression is that these are businesses that had already agreed to kind of come and now they're going to get some incentive just for doing maybe some rehab they already would have, but I don't know of any good evidence on on those incentives. But it, it might be something that's more in the area of what you're trying to think about, which is providing some type of services or infrastructure or cafes to the workers who are coming to a particular area. Thank you. Uh, Whole, Sarah. Whole Foods in a low-income neighborhood is probably not going to solve the problem. Well, we we, are, we heard it yesterday. You know, we heard a uh, an example yesterday. <coughs> of uh, a 70% tax abatement to bring 
a, a, a grocery store into a food desert type of area. I mean, that seems like something that's well, very targeted. Oh, it might happen. I mean, then uh, I live in Kalamazoo. The north side of Kalamazoo is a low-income neighborhood, and uh, it was a food desert, and the city uh, helped subsidize a grocery store to locate there so people would have better access to food at somewhat lower prices. Uh, I don't know exactly what the subsidy was and whether it was just uh, through property taxes. I don't recall at the top of my head, or they did some kind of tax increment financing. Again, I think we need to distinguish between economic and community development. They're different things. Uh, economic development deals with increasing the overall number of jobs in a local labor market as a way of boosting employment rates and real wage rates of workers in that local labor market. Uh, community development deals with trying to improve amenities and the quality of life in particular neighborhoods or uh, in, as a way of hopefully making them more attractive places. You want to make the downtown more attractive or make this neighborhood more attractive. I think those are important policies, but they have very different goals from what economic development programs are trying to do. Uh, looks like Sarah had a question. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of interest around government procurement policies as levers for economic development, just in terms of job creation and small business support. Curious on your thoughts on those, especially as they pertain to targeting more diverse populations or underserved communities. Like what kind of government procurement policies? I'm I'm curious what you mean. What what's a con? I mean, I realize you're not supposed to mention specific cities, but what would be a? Uh, can you give an example of that revealing the name of the city of, of a procurement policy? Who is it targeted at, and how much money is involved? Sure. So I think it's more process based. So, for example, in RFPs for local governments, prioritizing um, or setting quotas for BIPOC owned businesses. Well, I certainly think it'd be, it, it's, it, I mean, I think on the margin that trying to help some locally owned businesses, although I personally would stress more, let's provide, uh, you know, business incubator space, let's provide help in uh, business advice and help in the business starting up. You don't want the business necessarily to be a business that is dependent on having a quota and can't really survive on its own in the market long term. I mean, uh, not that, so I would I would urge that you have active programs uh, that help provide services to encourage the growth of businesses. It actually could be seen as a type of job training program. I mean, you know, it's some people want to get a job where they work for others. Other people want to uh, start their own business. And and just as there's a rationale for the government providing job training assistance to people who can't afford to pay for training themselves, there's a rationale for the government providing entrepreneurial training to people who want to start businesses. And that can certainly be something you want to target at distressed neighborhoods and people in those neighborhoods. So with apologies to any remaining questions, we have to end to be mindful of the time of our experts. I want to thank all of you very, very much for being here, Tim, Becky, and David, and for sharing the insights of your research and for a great conversation. And we are signing off for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Keep up the good thank work. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.